All right. So I think we are recording here and off and running. This is me soloing it here without the benefit of you guys keeping me company or any other eyes to look at while I go over some physical geography with you. What I want to do uh, for this recording is just pick up where we left off in our physical geography lecture that was relating to atmosphere and energy balance. So what I will do now is go ahead and see if I can do a screen share back to where we left off. And that would be right here. And this is where we left off, explaining why the sunsets are orange and red. And obviously I related that back to being a Broncos fan or not. That is not the correct answer. It relates to the fact that there's the greatest amount of atmosphere that needs to be traveled through by the visible light spectrum during sunrise and sunset periods, as opposed to less atmosphere as the sun is coming from a more direct overhead, somewhat overhead angle, depending on what your latitude is, where you are north and south of the equator, right? But anywhere you are, regardless, you're having a more oblique or more opaque angle of light coming through the greatest amount of atmosphere near the horizon. So moving on from that, I wanted to speak a little bit about albedo. And I, and I, we, I believe that we spoke about this uh, during the first day of class when we did the introduction talking about the snow melt and the ponds, the melt ponds that were forming in, around the Arctic Circle, such as on the Greenland ice sheets and how the melting ponds had a lower albedo or a more absorption of light than the surrounding snow or ice did. So let's just uh, explain a little bit more about the nuances of albedo here with this slide. And the essential nature of it is that the higher or the brighter the surface, uh, not higher, I, the higher the reflectivity is what I meant to say, or the brighter the surface, then you're going to have a higher albedo value, such as if you look over towards the mountain that's in this image and the snow on top, 80 to 95 percent albedo rating, which is its reflectivity, highly reflective. If we look down onto the far, sorry, the mountain was on the upper left, look down to the far right, we see the ocean or some kind of body of water here, maybe it's a lake, but those have a 10 to 60 percent, and that has to do with sun altitude or the elevation of the sun, the angle of the sun coming and the reflectivity that it may have. So angled sun will have a different albedo effect on water than a sun that's, say, directly above shining with the, the light coming straight into the water. Different percentages between 10 and 60. But nonetheless, 10 or 60, both of which are much lower than, say, fresh snow, up around up to 95. Likewise, if we want to go you know, to the other extreme, you look at forests or crops and grasslands, and those are down around 10%, uh, no matter what, 10 to 20%, as we can see at the, around the base of that mountain. So they have a very low albedo and a high absorption of incoming solar radiation. So you think about the brightness of the moon, for example, that's another piece that's on this little diagram. That's six to eight percent albedo or reflectivity. So it's really basically impossible for you to get a moon burn, as you know, some people joke about that the sun, even full moon with the reflectivity of the sun's solar radiation is not going to provide you anywhere near enough to be out in it for an entire night and have any solar radiation issues. Now we look at asphalt and blacktop roads, five to 10%. So they obviously have the lowest albedo rating of anything. And thus, they really absorb a lot of heat. And we notice that in Wyoming as we transition typically from fall to winter, where we'll get those first snows, but because the roads are still relatively warm, even if it's already started to cool off at night, cooler days, and we get you know sort of winter weather, but it takes a while for that asphalt to release all of that energy that it has been accumulating throughout the summer, let's say. And the ground, likewise, we will notice that same effect, but it's generally more dramatic in the case of roads. 
Now the opposite does happen through the course of the winter where we notice that rows get colder and colder and colder. And because they do give off their heat very readily as well, and eventually they get very cold. And so that when snow does fall, now that we're in the thick of the winter like now, we typically don't see that kind of melting and ice development like you do as more of a phenomenon in late fall if you get an early snow where the snow would just melt right on there and either just disappear, evaporate, or maybe run off. Or it could uh, melt it just enough that it melts the snow back into a liquid and then it freezes overnight. So you get that sort of worst case scenario, really. And, uh, and then you get really icy roads because of that. And then as we move into the warmer months, you get warm enough to where that warms back up. So then once you get a snow again, if you get a crazy graduation June, snowstorm hopefully by then the roads are at least warm enough and the days are long enough that it's likely going to evaporate fairly quickly so those are a few considerations uh, in the life of albedo and how it relates to us so how that relates to global processes though is things like short wave versus long wave radiation so clouds can do two types of have two types of albedo relationships with the earth one is with short wave radiation you have uh, particularly very high, if you have high clouds, and I'll, and I'll show you a, a next diagram that will kind of distinguish between the high and the low line clouds, slightly different compositions. But say you have these high, thin stratus clouds. What happens is they can, on a very cloudy day, they'll actually inhibit the amount of incoming solar radiation that is actually able to make it down to the Earth's surface. And so their reflectivity, that albedo, is occurring basically well above us. And so you just don't get a, that, uh, a large percentage of that incoming solar radiation on those days. And so it can result in just very cold days if you have a cold, if you have a very cloudy daytime, and you don't get that incoming solar radiation. Likewise, what you can happen though is the opposite. Say you don't have clouds during the day and you get a warm sunny day, and it's just all that nice, beautiful sunshine coming down everywhere on the, on the surface around you is absorbing that. And then let's say clouds roll in in the evening and then all night long, perhaps you have a cloudy night. That can actually create unusually warm nighttime temperatures because what's happening at that point is rather than short wave intense radiation coming from the sun, the earth is re-emitting a degree of long wave radiation. And that is happening, basically that's what the Earth does is convert long wave radiation, anything that's not directly reflected back in, in short wave through high albedo is then converted into long wave and re-radiated off slowly in that sense. That's like if you feel a rock that's been out in the sun, you go out to um, Vedavu or on a hike somewhere, and you can feel, or even, you know, on some nights where you walk on, on blacktop or something after a really warm day, and it still feels warm underfoot, because it's re radiated Well, that's long wave radiation that's coming off of that, very different from the short wave that the sun produces. If you have clouds <clears throat> somewhere in between that surface of the Earth and the outer atmosphere or out into space, then what those clouds can do is just cause that long wave radiation to just bounce back and forth, back and forth in between the clouds and the Earth's surface, creating a nice little sort of thermal layer, a little comforter of long wave radiation, warm air um, and uh, warm temperature over overnight. So that would be a scenario, ideal scenario for having a warm evening after a nice clear sunny day. The opposite would happen is if you had a cloudy daytime and then the clouds cleared up, disappeared, and nighttime was you know, sparkling, clear, no clouds in the sky, then what little radiation did make it in is now fully available in the long wave to just radiate all the way back out into space. And so it's gonna be a especially cold night, potentially, because you didn't have much warming happening during the day to even sort of charge any of the surface itself. So that kind of leads us into then thinking about how does heat get transferred? We talked about this short wave and long wave radiation, the albedo of clouds. What are some other forms other than just radiation, right, that heat is transferred? And here's four of them that you're expected to be familiar with. 
conduction, convection, advection, and radiation. So radiation, hopefully we're clear on that by now, energy traveling through air and space just fairly freely. Conduction is molecule to molecule. So there's physical contact happening, not just air or space, but some kind of physical median in between. It could be metal, could be wood, could be concrete, it could be any material, it could be hands on hands, right? Um, skin on skin, anything that allows heat from one side to physically come into contact and then transfer those, those molecules of energy across. Now, it's not saying that there's skin that's being removed from this side to this side. It's just the heat by molecules being touched together, the skin on skin, is allowing the heat to transfer directly between molecules. Um, convection is movement, heat that is transferred, and we'll look exactly how that works specifically in the case of water is a classic example. And then advection is horizontally dominant movement, so rather than sort of um, vertically, which is what, how we often imagine things transferred, it's a specific uh, horizontal. That's the one I'm, I'm least um, requiring you to be familiar with just because it's the one that we generally is least acknowledged or, or that we interact with on a daily basis. So for example, this is you know straight from the text, but it's a very helpful classic little sketch of radiation is if you have the pot held up above a hot burner, let's say these are electric metal burners. So there the coils are plugged into something, there's electric current that's generating the heat, and then it's being transmitted through metal little radiant um, bands. If you don't have the pot actually sitting on those coils, but just above them, that's radiation. Now conduction would be if the pot is sitting directly on the coils, which it's not in the, in the drawing here, but if you had it like you probably should, if you want to be cooking something, have the pot right on the coils, that would be conduction. Or as they show here, say it's a metal handle on a metal pot, which would be a poor design, but you know, I've had many camping pots that that has, right? You got to have some kind of a pot holder or something to work with it. But that would be the conduction is where that metal handle is, absorbing and transferring that heat along its length from the pot, which is hot because it's being heated by either radiation or by conduction itself from the bottom of the pot, heating up the metal. So that's conduction. And then likewise, that handle is conducting the heat from the pot, which was it went into the handle, and now the heat is being conducted from the handle into your hand. And so you feel it in that sense. Convection is when you have boiling water and you see that really nice bubbling that happens. And so when you have the bubbling, boiling water, I'm just gonna see if I can, I'm sorry. I just wanna see if I can move this little screen over somewhere where it's a little more centralized for me. And I'll get right back here. Um, so convection is that boiling water. What's happening is water is not being heated equally throughout the column of water, say in a pot or in a, jar or in a say a kettle and what's happening is obviously the water that's closest to the heating surface is going to heat up first and the water that's closest to the top is going to be the coolest but what actually also happens is when something like water in particular liquid heats up as it heats in this case the stuff at the bottom it expands and it actually rises to the top of the water column. And the cooler water conversely actually sinks because temperature based, colder materials tend to have greater density than warmer or hotter materials. The hotter material is, it expands generally. And it naturally wants to expand. And by expanding then, it's pushing itself more buoyant up to the surface of the pot. And then what happens then is as you have water at the bottom that's heating first, expanding, rising, and going to the top, then you have any cooler water that's at the top getting pushed or settling down to the bottom, but then now that's getting heated, and then that's gonna bubble up and you have this circulation motion called convection, and that is convection. Latent heat is what is contained within, let's say, water vapor. When water gets to the point of vaporizing, or as we commonly call it, steam, what happens if you put your hand over the top of this boiling pot, right? As opposed to putting your hand on the hot handle, you could get burned that way. 
but you can also very well get it by putting your hand over the steam rising up. And what happens is when that water touches your hand, it's much cooler than uh, 100 degrees Celsius, right? Or boiling temperature. Um, then what happens is um, that water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, what happens is that cools and releases a whole lot of latent heat that was contained in the water molecules as steam, and it releases those onto your skin. And that's like a steam burn, right? And that is latent heat. So when you hear latent heat, the first thing you should be thinking is water. Water's involved in latent heat. Not necessarily in conduction or convection or radiation, but latent heat is key and then vapor specifically, and understanding how water is related with latent heat. And I'll tell you why in just a second, that's so important. <laughs> Let's think about the energy balance in the troposphere. You have the greenhouse effect, and atmospheric warming is something that we need to unpackage and, and just look a little bit at now, and then hopefully we'll look at it some more later on in the semester as well. And think about how clouds and the earth work as an enormous greenhouse. And then the Earth atmosphere radiance balance. So here's a conventional greenhouse, this image here. And so what happened, how does a greenhouse ideally work in, in this sense is the glass in the house, and it's a closed uh, structure, ideally. The glass lets the shortwave radiation penetrate through, coming from the sun. And you could put a heat lamp out there too if you wanted to, but it's that shortwave radiation is easily penetrates through the glass and reaches the interior of that house. What it does then is it heats up that area just like it's heating the surface of the earth. But the difference is that where on any given day, depending on the conditions of the earth, you have long wave radiation that is re-emitted from the earth's surface back out into space. The glass in a greenhouse is opaque enough in the sense that it's not perfectly transparent in order to allow long wave radiation to leave unhindered. Only the short wave is able to, to penetrate it as effectively. The long wave being a different wavelength cannot penetrate through that and it gets trapped in the greenhouse. So it absorbs that short wave radiation or lets it be transmitted right through, but then it is capturing that any kind of long wave that might be re-emitted away to create just sort of a neutral effect, now what it does is has an escalating effect of every day that goes by, if you don't vent or open up the greenhouse on occasion, you would just get it incrementally hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And so it's affecting the gases that are inside there. Obviously it's gonna affect the humidity level. So typically the greenhouse then you will have a lot of moisture will accumulate because it's gonna heat up to a point where it's gonna create um, plants or other available water to be released into the air as it sort of um, heats to higher temperatures. The higher the temperature in the case of air, like water, it expands and it increases its capacity to hold moisture. And so thereby, you're going to have more of this sort of, just like when you get out of the shower, this moisture effect of condensation on the glass of the greenhouse, like you would on your windows or your mirrors in, in, in the shower. So that's a basic you know, understanding of what a greenhouse does in the relationship between long wave and short wave radiation. And you see then convection is created. And that's that because there's moisture now in the system, especially as that air is warming and expanding and increasing its capacity to move moisture. Then what it does is it's gonna have the warm air rising up towards the top of the greenhouse, cooler air settling down below. And then maybe if that cooler air starts to warm up because of that incoming solar radiation, then it will rise up and you get a convection circulation happening in that respect, just like with the boiling pot and water. So the greenhouse effect as it's applied then to a planetary atmospheric process is the atmosphere absorbs heat energy, incoming solar radiation, short wave, and then real greenhouse, although it traps heat essentially exclusively heat inside. The analogy when you apply it to an entire atmosphere around the planet is that it just increases the delay 
of heat to escape from the Earth out into space. So remember, it's not a closed system in the case of energy, insulation in particular, like we talked about open and closed systems. So in this case, what the atmosphere is doing is it's just creating that sort of opaque nature that's reflecting, providing some albedo effect, or reflecting some of that long wave radiation from leaving the Earth's surface as freely as if there was less of that element there. In this case, what's most often associated with it, carbon dioxide, it makes a very good element in respect to greenhouse effects of allowing shortwave radiation to penetrate it, but it restricts long wave radiation from passing back through it. And so you can imagine this being sort of that opaque glass that allows energy of one form to go through it, but not to go as easily back of a different type of energy long wave back through it. And so like you see here, clouds can be a greenhouse um, also forcing agent. And so as I mentioned, I already sort of described, talked our, our way through this one, but if you think about these high cirrus clouds and they're deflecting or reflecting some of that shortwave radiation back out and not allowing as much of it to, um, to reach the surface, then, oh sorry, you have the high clouds, the wispy ones are allowing it to get through the short wave radiation to penetrate through, but the long wave radiation is, re is detained. And then conversely, the long wave radiation in low dense stratus clouds is, is more like, like, a, like say tinted windows, let's imagine. These stratus clouds are more like a tinted window effect where they're stopping the initial short wave radiation from making it to the surface. And likewise, they're doing only so-so about really inhibiting long wave radiation from making it back out. So that has more of a cooling effect. It's these stratus clouds that are more like the clear glass, opaque glass, that cause the short wave to penetrate through them, but the long wave to be detained or sort of contained underneath them. And so when you consider this image here, what I want you to not worry about first and foremost is all of the numbers. Okay, I'm not gonna be asking you what each sort of value of atmospheric heat input as opposed to what's absorbed by atmospheric gases and dust, um, which would be say a plus 18 out of 100, or what the Earth's albedo average is of negative 31. What I want you to be familiar with though is just the general idea of what's going on here, that there are there is a certain amount of solar radiation that is absorbed by atmospheric gases and dust. And, and what, you know, roughly what amount is that compared to the total? Well, it's 18, 20%, so it's something to, to consider. And so if we think about more gases or dust being introduced into the atmosphere, hmm, then that's gonna go up from say just a 20%, 18 in this, you know, to be exact according to this one, then if you increase that up to 20, 25%, that's a significant change in absorption of solar radiation by atmospheric gases, right? As opposed to, let's say, reflected by clouds is a negative 21. What's absorbed by clouds is actually very little. Clouds themselves don't absorb much. It's just plus three, as you can see in this image here. And then you think uh, reflected by the surface is a negative three. So it's not too much overall, but what really plays roles is those atmospheric gases and dust. And then you think about the overall Earth's Albedo is about 31, and Earth's radiated, energy radiated back into space is 69. So right between 30 and 70, these two. So the albedo is about a 30, and radiated energy is 70 going back out. So when we think of just the incoming solar radiation, where is it focused on around Earth? And that is the Earth energy budget. Right, and there's a balance that's created, and that's because there's a surplus of energy out of the total that accumulates in the tropics, right, between 23 and a half degrees and 23 and a half degrees, right, north and south of the equator. That's that sweet spot that's always getting a net gain of energy in it. That's where the tropics are, kind of the warmest, mildest climates are. And then as you go towards the poles, above that 23 and a half into 60 and all the way up to 90 degrees, 
you move towards a deficit of energy because there's periods throughout a year where both the poles, each in their own season, have almost no energy coming to them, right? Periods of long darkness, weeks on end, or periods of very short days for months on end. And so that, as well as in their summer times, they'll have days of entire days of sunlight, no sunset, or very long days. And then that create, but it's not enough to overcome the deficit of always being at more of the obtuse angle, right? Less of a direct angle coming down wherever you are north of that 23 and a half degrees. And what happens though is, but naturally, just like if we think of that boiling pot of water and the convection that happens of the hot air, hot water, let's say, moving up towards the surface as it expands and the cooler water sort of descending and then it gets heated as it's down towards the element of the pot and coming back up. Well, the energy of heat incoming solar radiation flows forward from the equator as that's the, the positive side and it actually moves to fill in the deficits around the poles. And so that creates our initial circulation patterns of global atmospheric circulation. Kind of taking a step back for a moment and checking in with your own life experiences all of us have lived through many days and many nights by this point what have your experiences told you about what is the hottest time of the day the, the time of the day when the temperature is the highest in the thermometer and what is the time of the night when you would expect it to be the coldest. If somebody says, okay, now we, we need to measure what the coldest that it gets within this 24 hours, the next 24 hours, what exact time are you gonna pick to go out into uh, the elements, especially in Wyoming in the winter, it can be pretty harsh. And you don't, so you don't wanna waste a whole bunch of time going back and forth every hour, getting you need your sleep, right? You wanna know, when is the best moment that I'm most likely going to just nail it right when it's the coldest? What time would you say is going to be the coldest time of the day? Is it going to be nine at night? Is it going to be midnight? Exactly. Somewhere thereabouts, one, one o'clock in the evening. Is it going, or in the you know, early morning? Is it going to be five in the morning? Is it going to be mm, seven or eight in the morning? that's going to be the coldest period. All things given, right? There's variables like I talked about. You could have a cloudy night and that's going to maybe retain heat if you had a clear day before or vice versa. You had a cloudy day and a cold night. You know, there's certain or winds that, that kick up at a certain time through the night that might influence with wind chill factors, but just sort of a neutral day and night period. When do you think that would be? Well, the odds are might kind of jump to the chase here because I don't have the opportunity to have a discussion with you with this recording is you would not expect it to be right at either midnight for the coldest or noon for the warmest and that's because <clears throat> there's a lag time sort of like charging a battery or turning on an electric stove and waiting for that burner to kind of it's getting as soon as you turn it on high it's getting a whole bunch of electrical current to it to create heat but it's not instantaneously hot you know the better ones they are the usually the shorter amount of time it takes for them to get hot but it takes a moment right even if it's a few seconds or a split second likewise with incoming solar radiation on the earth's surface and daytime and nighttime temperatures it takes hours to accumulate not just hit when the peak amount of insulation is coming through it has to kind of that peak insulation needs to kind of be absorbed and re-radiated and a little bit more accumulated. So you get to your peak, usually about, you know, say three hours after um, whatever the highest um, zenith angle is for the sun that day, right? And as we know, if you're at different latitudes, like here in Laramie, that peak, you might have, the sun might actually be overhead because of daylight saving time and other ways we kind of trick ourselves with time and, and the relationship with the sun might be more like one o'clock or two o'clock, and the warmest part of the day might be closer to five o'clock, four o'clock or five o'clock with this lag. And then likewise, cooling off, you wouldn't expect midnight to be back to zero, 
right? Or whatever the coldest temperature is gonna be. It takes all the way, typically, the best rule of thumb as far as the coldest temperature is gonna be the time closest to just before sunrise, depending on the season, right? Because sunrise changes from say 5 a.m. in the summertime to you know 7 or, or 7.30 in, in the middle of winter. It's gonna be that period before any new energy starts coming in to be absorbed to create some warmth and that thereby leaving the longest amount of time since energy was last put into the system right which was so the sun set at say five o'clock or seven o'clock and then from seven all the way until the last moment before the sun you know pre-sunrise so let's say if sunrise is at seven then you would expect around six o'clock or so to be the coldest time of the day and um, and hopefully you've all experienced that and kind of figure this out on yourself on your own but maybe you hadn't sort of made the connections like we're making here and that's what i'm hoping for you to to have in this class throughout the class is these kind of sort of little connecting moments between your life and and, and life on earth so um one more concept to check in on now is bringing this latent heat back in and introducing uh, one other term, sensible heat. So latent heat is the heat of evaporation, or as I mentioned, when you have that boiling water turned to vapor, right? It's evaporating, it releases energy into the environment. And then what happens is it condenses, okay? Just like if you put your hand over a boiling pot of water, uh, water is, is gonna be steam and vapor, and, but when it touches your hand, guarantee you, it's gonna cool and condense and you're gonna get a little puddle sort of moisture on your hand because it went from being a gas back to a solid on your hand. And in the process, it released hundreds of calories of heat right into your hand and you get the steam burn. Whereas sensible heat, to put it generically, is the dry heat, whereas latent heat is the wet heat. So sensible heat is heat that can be measured with a thermometer. That's what your thermometer is always telling you, it's a sensible heat. Whereas the latent heat is not necessarily measured uh, with a thermometer as well, because it's ca what's carried in the water moisture, not just in the, the ambient sort of temperature that's in a room, let's say. And it's a measure of the concentration of kinetic energy. So it's basically, kinetic energy is energy in motion. And so what sensible heat is, is it's measuring the energy that's literally bouncing off of like say a thermometer, the mercury, scale on there it's literally hitting that and creating a fluctuation in it based on the exchange of energy energy and motion in particular and so we go back to that little convection latent heat occurring there with the boiling water the vapor and sensible heat sorry i'm just going to go back to this for one more second sensible heat is you holding that hot handle that sensible heat there's no water intermediary between there it's just you and a hot handle that's going to be sensible heat the latent heat is that is that heat that's carried in the water vapor itself those molecules are going to cause a reaction maybe a somewhat lightly delayed reaction too even so global latent heat the things i want you to key in on uh, and i sort of color-coded the um, little descriptors here or questions that i put at the bottom of this image is where are the high latent heat areas? So latent heat, water, first thing you should be doing as you look at this map is trying to discern where the continents are, where the oceans are. And then if I'm asking you latent heat, even more so then is key in where the oceans are. And you can see there's key parts in the, along the equator, you know, which should be the other first thing you do as a geographer if you're looking for heat, because that's where the most, that's where the, the positive energy balance is, whereas the poles are gonna be the negative energy balance. And so we look around the equator and we look along the Pacific there off the coast of uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Northern South America. And then on the Atlantic side, likewise, in the Caribbean, Jamaica, um, Cuba, Florida. And you see this really kind of the most intense area, the Gulf Stream. And we'll talk more about this a little in, in another class, but why that is such a 
literal hot spot as far as uh, the warmest water on Earth, as far as amongst the oceans, can be found along that zone. And that has to do with this sort of the circulation that gets put in motion through convection and through the unequal heating of a spherical surface like the Earth. And then the other areas you can see off the coast of uh, the east coast of Africa and the southern coast of India, heading towards Australia, all through Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And then likewise, off the coast of Japan, you see another kind of hot spot there, and that's related to, to the circulation. Now, if latent heat has to do with water and humidity, if I ask you where the lowest latent heat would generally be geographically, well, the first easy thing you do is go, go let's start up at the poles, right? We're gonna, because that's always in a deficit compared to the tropics, and go with a continent like Antarctica, somewhere in the middle of land, that although there's snow and ice there, it's actually very dry because it's just sort of permanently frozen and, and snowy, right? Or Siberia, let's say, or Mongolia, those types of places. Or in the case of North America, Wyoming and the deserts of the West, like Utah and parts of uh, Southern Idaho, okay? And we can see that on the map there. Uh, if you look for where Wyoming is in North America, that's that blue area that has the lowest latent heat. But another really standout thing that just kind of helps me remember this relationship between dryness and moisture content as far as determining latent heat is if we look at North Africa where the Sahara Desert is, is that's a really low latent heat area. But it's in the tropics essentially. It's almost, you know, it's down near the equator. It's and the equivalent, if you look left or right of it, in really high latent heat areas of the oceans on either side of it. But because of that Sahara Desert, sand and low vegetation to hold on to moisture, no large bodies of water, then boom, it's really low latent heat. Now, look at that piece of Africa right there, upper Africa heading towards the Mediterranean Sea. And as I move to the next slide, key in on that same region again, and what do we see for sensible heat? It's huge, it's really, really high. It's a high because it's so dry that the sensible, the temperature heat, there's nothing to kind of, there's no water to sort of absorb the heat. It's just out and about there, right? And so that is a high sensible heat zone. And the deserts that is largely all of Australia, you can see is a very arid environment, has a very high sensible heat component. Where are the areas with the lowest sensible heat? Well, sensible heat is dealing with primarily dry conditions. So the first thing then you think of is sensible heat and low oceans, really humid environments. And so then we can see that throughout the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian oceans. Um, and it's the continents, land, that you're going to find the highest sensible heat, especially the most arid places on each continent like the Southwest in the case of the United States and Northern Mexico, Baja California, those are our highest sensible heat. So here's a couple comparisons between British Columbia and a location in California. And again, just by looking at the pictures, you can see one area is fairly irrigated. It looks like a crop, maybe um, vegetables or fruit orchards that are growing there and you have a irrigation canal next right there in the foreground. So that's gonna have a high latent heat, low sensible heat. The latent, latent nature of a moist environment is gonna help sort of moderate that heat too. And then the other thing that it does though is it creates less of a fluctuation. If you look at the sensible heat, green sort of light green line that's in the British Columbia, the bottom graph there, you can see it, it it has an arch and a, and a peak and a dip to it, sort of, but it's fairly consistent. Where if you look at the desert graph, along with the image of the cactus and the sand, you can see how much that sensible heat really peaks up and then drops way down. And those of us that have been to desert environments, if you've been to a place like Las Vegas or Moab or, or even the Red Desert in southwestern Wyoming, deserts are known for the highest range of temperatures often in a day, for example, or, or in a year, because they can cool off. They heat up, 
really quickly because that heat is just right there and there's no water to kind of have to get sort of charged up or, or, or heated up to absorb that and the land just, just absorbs it directly but then it immediately releases it in the evenings let's say and so it's able to cool down obviously desert environments they're deserts for a reason probably much less even though in this picture there's some clouds in the desert less likely to get precipitation or have clouds around so they're typically more clear skies at night and so even more availability to cool off quickly and so that's where you have that huge temperature swing of sensible heat in dry arid environments so this is just another blow up of that and the last piece I'll talk about for this lecture is the her urban heat island. And so we have the um, differentiation of heating and cooling that occurs in different human impacted environments. So if we consider in this area, we have a farmland on the far right, a river, an urban park area, downtown metropolitan sort of zone, a suburbia, and then like a rural environment. You can see by this chart here that is graphing the temperature throughout, let's say a given, at a given moment, and a given day, what you would expect to see in a variation just in this landscape, say across, it could be just a, less than 100 miles, 50 miles of farmland. Think about the front range of Colorado because we don't really have a whole lot of urban areas that have as significant of, of, a, of an impact here in Wyoming, but think of metropolitan Denver compared to heading east towards surrounding farmlands or heading west towards where there's a lot of more sort of urban parks and kind of suburban development heading towards the Front Range, right, of the Rocky Mountains. And, and you would actually find differences in sensible heat in a given day. And that's because what happens is in these what we call urban heat island effect. So they kind of create their own islands of climate. And one of them is a lower albedo. There's a lot of concrete, a lot of blacktop, even more so, a lot of streets going on in an urban environment typically, and you have a lot of buildings, right? And what happens with the buildings is even if they appear reflective, what happens is they create these sort of canyons of reflection that happens. So it might be a nice shiny mirrored glass building, but it's taking that energy that's coming in at an angle from the sun, hitting the glass, and then shooting it at another angle, potentially back down into, further into the lower depths of the city. And it continually, all of just that movement bouncing back and forth between buildings is releasing heat. And so that alone is creating something that a flat surface either a, a grassland environment or even a forested environment is less likely to have that kind of all of that partitioning of radiate light as it comes in from the sun likewise the long wave radiation is going to be bouncing off of that as it's coming back off of that blacktop it's the ultimate destination often at the bottom of the city and so that radiation is going the long wave radiation is going to be much further delayed again, sort of that greenhouse effect in a different sort of way of getting re-emitted back out into space. And then the other com com components are the fact that urban environments, at least in this day and age, have a lot more emissions than a rural environment does typically as far as, well, there's hundreds of thousands of more people per acre than a rural environment or a natural environment that has no people on it that are emitting things like they have their heaters on in their homes if it's winter or they're cooking things and so they have their stoves on that are creating heat that is not being generated naturally in an environment on its own unless it's some kind of a volcanic location in particular they're not creating this extra energy sources that then are being emitted out into the immediate area plus with the use of vehicles for transportation, um, air conditioning units, heating units, that often emits particulates into the atmosphere, especially automotive exhaust, for example. And what happens is that creates a layer that, again, is sort of this um, temporary or somewhat permanent, depending on your perspective here, 
of a greenhouse dome structure. It's around that kind of lives, hovers around that city, right? Smog, we've all seen it. I'm sure anybody that's driven to Denver notices a different in air quality as you go down from Wyoming down towards that environment. There's, there's more of this sort of opaque kind of cloudiness haze, right? And that's because there's just more particulates. There's more things getting moved and stirred up and, and stuff emitted into the air there. And that is going to cause some of this urban heat effect as well. And so, you know, we think about the properties of bricks, of steel, of asphalt, you know, blacktop, all of those have different rates of albedo, but all of them, when they're interacting in these different angles, accentuate each other as well. And, uh, and then this urban canyon effect, as I mentioned, as far as just the heating and the refraction and, and the reflection of light, also it can cut and influence speed, wind speed. It can either diminish the effect, like for example, even in the town of Laramie, I noticed in town less of a sensation of the high wind than if I go out of town a few miles and I'm out on the actual plains there, do you feel the wind a lot more? Even, even though I'm walking around, yes, I'll certainly see trees blowing and, and so on and so forth when we have 60 miles an hour wind in town. But even just going around through the neighborhoods, you, that breaks up, even though we only have maybe at most two-story buildings for the most part, aside from what's on campus, that breaks up that wind. Whereas in a city environment, then you really see that happening. But if it's a more modern block row, sort of square checkerboard development of right angle streets, then it can also be a channeling effect that causes if the wind's coming from the west, all of the west east running streets are gonna sort of channel the wind down and through them. And that can cause other kinds of relationships as far as how the heat that's being generated in there gets circulated in only limited ways. And then obviously, as I mentioned before, just vehicles emitting heat as the cars or engines are running and you have tens of thousands of those going at a given day, that is gonna generate more heat and pollution in them. So. And typically in cities, you have less space that's dedicated to plants and other types of surfaces other than developed constructed surfaces. And so what people are doing to try and help manage and mitigate against these heat island effects in, in any urban center you're, you're dealing with these is starting to move towards basically sort of mimicking natural surfaces to help with some of that process and so that could be putting green roofs on buildings so flat top buildings that actually have a capacity to grow lawn or shrubs and vegetation on them to allow less of this sort of you know it may absorb some like plants do as opposed to say a reflective mirrored glass building surface but also they can those plants are going to need water right and so then that water can absorb and not create such a sensible heat effect of a dry, arid environment, which cities essentially are, because everything's designed to shed water and make the water disappear so we're not in funky, mosquito-ridden sort of pools and ponds to have to go through all the time like we did in the olden days with potholes and, and so on. And so um, also looking at pavements that have a higher albedo. So rather than blacktop roads exclusively, or parking lots even, you know, is easier to manage, even if roads are left with blacktop, having instead of these huge um, box store black asphalt parking lots, go into, um, I'll show you a picture here. Some of these kinds of tree covered, putting more trees in parking lots, these sort of green areas that are just spaces, um, public spaces or the roof of a building, um, creating these sort of shade zones. This is sort of a very sort of futuristic one there at the top. But um, I think I, no, I don't have another one, but one was where you go with uh, more of a sidewalk concrete material that has a much higher albedo as, as you probably experience in your own selves. Stepping in your bare feet in the middle of summer onto blacktop street compared to a white concrete sidewalk, two different experiences, right? That white concrete sidewalk is usually very manageable and almost maybe even feel, feels cool. Whereas the blacktop street will burn your bottoms of your feet very quickly. And so looking at that, or even I've seen where they have these just sort of like uh, cement or concrete kind of tiles that 
that are hollow in the middle, like sort of look like giant snowflake blocks or something. And you put those down and link them all together like bricks in the parking area. But that all those holes can then be filled in with, with dirt and then ideally seed planted with, with grass, where they may need to be mowed on occasion, but it creates sort of this permanent structure because of the bricks, you know, allow the cars, support the weight of the cars to drive on them, but then it's not just a pure blacktop or an asphalt or, or cement structure because the other thing is having that porous nature of all the holes in the cement, the little spaces, then allows moisture rather than just being shed and run away from the city to be maintained within the city. And so then that allows for latent heat process where water is a really good sort of absorber and charger of heat in and of itself rather than a very dry environment where then that heat just gets radiated immediately into the environment and just feels hot. So that is the end of this piece of lecture that I did not get to finish with us, just kind of taking care of you know, housekeeping from our last uh, meeting. And I look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday. And we will be going over our study guide answering any questions or any particulars if you have about study guide or the practice questions and, or any other content as you're getting ready to take the exam between Wednesday evening and Friday at 11. So you have about you know, 48 hours to do a 50 minute 35 question exam. Uh, other than that, you still have to do the lab for the week. So make sure you stay on that. And um, I look forward to any questions in the meantime by email or come by, schedule an office hour visit, or just drop by. I'm here most, most days. So thanks again, and uh, see you soon.